everyone has that friend who like loves skincare and or really into makeup. You know, like I have friends where I'm like, teach me how you do the thing that you just did. I was always that person for hair. My credit card showed it. Like I was like buying like hundreds of dollars of stuff where like I'd be kind of okay buying like a drugstore eye pencil or like a lip balm. Like it wasn't the thing that I invested in. My hair was always the thing I invested in. Welcome to Hashtag Skinthusiast, the podcast. I'm your host, Amy. I am a practicing cosmetic dermatology PA, and on this show, we are going to talk to dermatologists, brand founders, skin and hair experts, so you can get all the tips and tricks to take your hair care and your skincare to the next level. This show is fun and casual and loaded with priceless information. Think of it like the coffee chat with the beauty gurus whose brains you've always wanted to pick. You're not going to get this kind of insight anywhere else. Today on the podcast, we have Diana Cohen, who is the founder of cult favorite hair care brand, Crown Affair. I started using Crown Affair when it initially first launched, and I felt like finally there was a hair care brand that was efficacious, but also beautiful on my shelf. She's the queen of the air dry and of brand building, so there's something in this episode for everybody. Diana, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, Amy. I'm so excited to chat with you, and I know the audience is going to get a lot from this conversation. So I always start the podcast with asking, what is your first skincare memory? But in this case, I think we have to go with what is your first hair care memory? I have a few, but I would say like core memory for me is when I would jump in the pool growing up and I would like take a shower after my mom would comb my hair. I would like sit on the side of the tub. She's like my mom combing my hair and like taking care of my hair. Mm -hmm. It makes me really nostalgic, honestly. And then in like a more sciencey way, I remember learning as like a kid when I was a little bit older that like chlorine was not good for your hair. Whenever there was like a birthday party or like a sleepover, I would like be that kid who like tiptoe to like the sink in like a bathroom and would like wet my hair as like an eight year old. That young. Yeah. And then I would get in the chlorine because I'm like the fiber fills with fresh water versus chlorinated water. So I've just, this has always kind of been in my bones. I cannot (laughs) believe you had those thoughts that young. I was just like in the pool, hair, a rat's nest, didn't care. I I wish I would have cared. I know. I honestly don't know where I learned it from. I feel like it was my mom or my mom's friends that were like talking about it one day. And it was honestly one of those like awakening moments where I'm like, oh, you have to like care for your hair in the same way you care for like your skin or your body or whatever it is. So yeah. Was your hair lighter than it is now when you were younger or has that always been this color? It was a lot lighter. It's interesting since moving to Miami, there's definitely pieces that have come out. Mm-hmm. Like I look at photos when I lived in New York for 12 years yeah. and my hair is dark. It's always been brown. Like my sister had blonde hair growing up. Uh-huh. I've always been a proper brunette. Yeah, I've always had super dark hair. My hair was black when I was born. So I, my daughter's hair is blonde. Aww. And so I worry. I'm like, oh, when she gets older, I'm going to have to do the whole chlorine thing with yes. the green hair and yeah. go through all. I never had to go through any of that because yes. my hair was so dark. Yeah, I love your color, though. You know this. I'm like oh, here you. for a very rich, deep brown. I used to highlight my hair, but now I've like kind of glossed it over to my natural color. So now just like waiting for those old highlights to kind of grow out. But I, I love the like natural hair color movement. I think it's like very freeing. It's very much happening. And I think there's more education now around like glossing versus permanent Mm -hmm. dyes and I'm very much here for like living your life with the hair that you have yeah I mean that's like your whole ethos so we're definitely going to get into that (laughs) but I want to get into your career journey a little bit because you have an extensive brand background so you started at into the gloss before glossier was even a a thing and you also worked with glossier and away so many Mm -hmm. amazing brands so where did you start and how did you get here today So I'm from South Florida, so I love this full circle moment. But when I was 18, I was very ready to leave and I was dreaming of going to New York. So I went to NYU. I studied art history and Italian. Did I don't even think I really knew what like marketing was. I thought marketing was like Mad Men advertising (laughs) or something because if you don't grow up in it, like no one teaches you. So I studied art history and I loved fashion, which is why I wanted to go to New York like so many of us. And uh, I interned at a ton of places. And my last internship, which turned into a role, was at Into the Gloss. And when I went into school, I thought I wanted to like work at Condé Nast and like live that dream Andy Mm -hmm. Sachs Devil Wears Prada life. But the reality of the world when I was graduating in 2012, 2013, the internet was real. (laughs) Like it was happening and the writing was on the wall. And personally, I was just obsessed with Into the Gloss. Like those are some of my 
earliest beauty kind of conscious memories of like being excited about product, understanding why people love stuff. And it was honestly like the first platform that didn't feel like Emily was interviewing incredible people from like cool girls doing interesting things to like proper celebrities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was like, oh, here's the random rose water I use. That's like $8 and here's how I use it. And it kind of democratized beauty in a way that I'd never seen before. And I definitely became obsessed with that. And I think even it's so funny, I was thinking about it recently in the context of product development, but I feel like, you know, into the gloss was like, okay, I use this NARS thing and I mix it with this thing and it gives me this dream product. I love that. And that's the magic. It's not just like these one single skews. It's like you as a person moving through the world, like putting things together. I transcribed pretty much every interview on the site during those years. And I joke that it was like Mr. Miyagi, like, you know, and like Daniel's son is like, why am I waxing on and off this yeah. car? And you feel kind of silly and you're like, can't this be quicker? But the education that I got, like transcribing interviews from like Laura Mercier, like Amazing. Bobby Brown, like legends, people, yes. their stories. And Emily is probably one of the best interviewers I've ever listened to, but it was all text-based. So mm-hmm. I was getting the audio of like two hours you know, transcribing and then two minutes of it was actually put on the site. But just even the concepts around, I think from a brand perspective, I remember specifically with Laura Mercier's interview, her whole concept of like creating like touchable makeup. Like before that, it was very like Kevin Aquan and like Mm -hmm. perfected, beautiful woman, Mm -hmm. traditional. And for her, it was like, oh, I want to like hold you and like kiss you and like touch my face. And even with like what we're doing with hair care, so much of what I want is touchable hair, Mm -hmm. hair that moves with you, not this like perfect glass, like not realistic day-to-day thing. So started into the gloss and then I was really lucky to work at a number of consumer brands. But before that, I worked at a company called Spring, Mm -hmm. which was a mobile shopping app. Nobody's heard of it, but it was like the most epic team ever. And we had all the D2C brands on the platform in 2013. So this was like early days of Warby Parker and Harry's and outdoor voices. And Emily was starting to work on Glossier. Yeah, it was an epic time. And the internet was different. Like it was really affordable to acquire customers online Mm -hmm. at that time, like very cheap. And it was just a new frontier of people kind of disrupting these legacy categories. And I learned a lot about the internet. I mean, Shopify was like baby back in 20, this is 10 years ago. Magento, Demandware, One Stop was what like all of the Andrew Rosen brands were on. I just learned about like, oh, e-commerce yep. is happening in front of us. So that was super cool. After spring, I worked, I was there for a little over two years and I worked with Tamar Mellon, the founder of Jimmy Choo, when she was launching her direct-to-consumer shoe line. She's amazing. Working with her was like incredible. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was pretty epic and um, got to spend a lot of time in LA, which I never really did before, which opened my eyes, honestly, to a whole new world being so like, I love New York. New York's the best. I feel like that was kind of our generation. Yes. Yes. And going to LA for like stretches of three weeks at a time for nine months was like, oh, wow, there's a whole universe out here that's like- So different. So different. But I was pretty familiar. My mentor actually, who I worked for at Spring, lived in LA. So I was kind of remote working with her back in 2013, which is crazy Yeah. in hindsight. Then I worked at Away the luggage company. Mm -hmm. I was the eighth employee there. Learned a lot. So early. I am still very close with our early team there. Learned a ton about brand building when we launched the business. I wasn't there for launch. I was there after launch. But when we first started really shipping suitcases, like there were a number of players in the space that don't exist today. Yeah, I think it's a very good lesson. And conversely, you know, I haven't worked there in six years. And now I type in a way to the search bar on Google and there's like 40 new brands. So many. So many brands. So I, that's been a really interesting marker from a brand perspective of how quickly you can see the landscape change mm-hmm. on both ends. And it's something I do keep in mind as in building Crown Affair. But it was great. And I kind of met my like core people there that actually helped me build Crown Affair. My art director, my social media person, my PR person, we were all like first 20 people at a way. So I always tell people like, keep those relationships, stay close, you know? And then after a way, I launched my own brand agency called Levitate, worked with Harry's to launch their women's line Flamingo, which was so fun. Oh, I love Flamingo. Such a great brand, such a great product. And Jeff and Andy, honestly, from that early, like Warby Parker, Harry's days in 2013, to this day, the best leaders I've ever worked with. Like, no joke, like just incredible people and the way that they lead is a lot to take from that. And then worked with Buck Mason, the men's wow. brand. I'm actually wearing a Buck a Mason lot. jumpsuit That's right so now. so cute. They have women's now, which I'm so happy about I because I, I met Sasha and Eric, the founders, when I was working at Spring. They were one of our brands. Mm-hmm. 
and then to like work with them as a client. Yeah. But it's so funny for years. They only had men's for like yeah, eight years. Yeah, a long time. And I would always try to make the men's stuff fit. And I'm like, you guys have to make women's. They're like, we'll do an off menu. So like the girls who knew would like go into the stores. It is so fun. It was like a secret thing. And now they finally have it and they're thriving. Yeah. And a ton of other brands, a baby food company, Yumi. Mm-hmm. So fun. They're amazing. Trying to think. Oh, and Outdoor Voices. That was my biggest yeah. client. So did influencer, ambassador, celebrity. Wow. And that was like, honestly, kind of the last frontier of Instagram mm-hmm. in like the traditional sense where you could just like send somebody something and they yes. would like post. There was no conversation about yes. like payment really or like rights or usage. I mean, there were girls who were getting paid a lot, yeah. but I would say the ecosystem in 2017, 2018 was still very like influencers with a capital I, like yeah. the girls who were getting paid yes. big checks. Mm-hmm. And then everyone else is kind of everyone a micro yeah, and everyone else. Exactly. The landscape has obviously changed so much. Yeah. And I launched Crown Affair, did levitate for about a little over two and a half years and was working nights and weekends on Crown Affair and launched the business January 28th, 20, 2020. So mm-hmm. six weeks before the pandemic yeah. and coming up on four years, which is honestly insane. It feels like longer. I think it's that COVID effect that like time is warped, but I I mean, I, I was a fan of Crown of Air from like early on and I feel like I've been using it for a lot longer than four years. So it's crazy that you you. say that only four years. Thank you. What was your inspiration to start the brand? Like what was the moment when you're like, I'm going to do this? There were a couple big moments. I mean, the first like core foundational one is that I've always loved hair care and even, you know, I feel like you're a great example. Everyone has that friend who like loves skincare and or really into makeup. You know, like I have friends where I'm like, teach me how you do the thing that you just mm-hmm. did. I was always that person for hair. My credit card showed it. Like I was like, buying like hundreds of dollars of stuff on Violet Gray where like I'd be kind of okay buying like a drugstore eye pencil or like a lip balm. Like it wasn't the thing that I invested in. My hair was always the thing I invested in. So I would say that because people would text me and they're like, what are you using? And I'm like, try this new Orbe thing, try this new Christoph Robin thing. And like, Mm -hmm. here's how you use it. So that was the foundation. But like, how do you take that and turn it into a brand? Obviously building brands for a long time, like just looking at what was on my shelf or in my shower and being like, I actually don't connect to this at all. The stuff that I like from a formulation perspective was not actually aligned from a brand perspective. You're like hiding it so you don't have to look at it. Either either hiding it or being like, why does this look like, it's just very like French salon, professional stylist. And like, I love that, but like, it just felt dated, like yeah, the packaging, the components, the brand messaging, like mm-hmm. no empowerment as like a person. It's all about the stylist. And, it's, yep. you know, all the content, honestly, so much of the content online with hair care, truly like prior to Crown Affair, it's like you go on a brand's website and it's like model with wet hair, sitting in a chair with no identity, no personality, and like the stylist doing so something. True. And there's like a beautiful art in that. I have mm-hmm. so much respect for like hair as art. I want to know how to put this thing on my hair at home and like how to take care of my hair the 60 to 90 days beyond the haircut. Yeah. So, or like a lot of the stuff that was healthier or treatment based was very like granola y or Whole Foods y. Yes. I could never get that stuff to work for my hair. Like the experience, the user experience was just not there. User experience, not there. Great for like a Sunday at home to do like a deep treatment, but like not day-to-day usage to make my hair look and feel amazing. The moment that I was like, I got to do this. I was coming up on a couple of my contracts with Harry's, with Outdoor Voices. And I think you reach an inflection point where you're like, I kind of want to start building my own thing again. I talk to people all the time who go back and forth between consulting and full time. And I'm like, you got to do what's right for you in that moment. And I think coming off of a way, which was like a seven days a week job, I needed consulting to like have balance and structure in my life. And at that time would levitate my core pillars were like, choose who I work with and create my own schedule. I love that. But at a (laughs) certain, the dream, the dream. And I, and I built it and I did it. And then I did just reach a point where I'm like, I feel like I'm giving a lot of my like creative juice and relationships and I wanted to do it for those brands, but there's only so many Harry's and so Mm -hmm. many outdoor voices and I did not want to build an agency. So I started to be like, what is it that I want to do? I went to Japan in 2019 that changed everything. I just remember being so in awe. I feel like when you watch a Pixar movie, you're just like in awe all the time and you feel like that magic feeling. And I was just in Japan for a few weeks being like, 
wow, something in myself is so open, like how they think about rituals, how they care for things, the respect that they have. Like you go into a cute little tiny sushi spot. There's a cup on the wall that has been there for 80 years mm-hmm. that they like care for and it's displayed beautifully. And But they also use things. Right. It was just so inspiring. I also went to a head spa, which was my first head oh, spa. I've heard of these. They're coming up in the States now and it's basically like the opposite of like dry bar or like a blowout. And don't get me wrong. I love a blowout Mm -hmm. as much as the next person. It was basically a facial for your scalp. Amazing. It was magical. It didn't like change my hair in the sense that like I walked out being like my hair's transformed, but it was just like more philosophically very impactful. And I was introduced. I never really like thought about subaki seed oil, which is the Camilla flower. Mm -hmm. And it shows up in skincare, but it's never really been like a hero ingredient in a huge way. Mm -hmm. Molecularly, it's very lightweight, much lighter weight for someone like me. I have a lot of hair, but it's actually like pretty fine. Mm -hmm. So like coconut oils and argan oils, they kind of make my hair look greasy. Right. And especially with like a Mm leave-in, like I feel like I could never use a leave-in conditioner before Mm -hmm. because I'd spray it in and it would like clump. Yes. So not. And you're like, oh good, I just washed my hair. Yeah. I need to wash it again. I gotta go wash it again. (laughs) And I always joke with Crown Affair and I think when I was in Japan, I was introduced to all these products that like I couldn't mess up. Mm -hmm. They weren't heavy. They weren't greasy. And then I came back to the States and looked in my shower and was like, this isn't it. Yeah. And a lot of the salon products, while effective in terms of achieving a style, are not the best for the health of your Mm -hmm. hair. You know, so that kind of opened my world to like, how do we make products that are like clean? And I use that term loosely, but like good for you and good for your hair. And I think that, you know, clean makeup has done this well. Mm -hmm. Like you wouldn't launch a makeup line in 2023 that doesn't also have skincare benefits. Right, right. That's so true. And we just weren't seeing that Mm -hmm. in hair care in the same way. It was either like you can have the benefits and none of the uh, like efficacy or you can have the performance efficacy, but none of the benefits. Right. So that was really like the spark moment. And I came back to New York and I was like, I got to build this thing. I want it. I want it, you know, and that's how, you know, I think once you're like, I want to wake up and use this thing. Mm -hmm. And quickly on the tool side, because we did launch there, like I've been recommending beautiful tools to my friends for years. And all of the tools that I'm recommending are like $200 hairbrushes. And, you know, even with like the combs, I would recommend the beautiful Bully combs. Mm -hmm. You know, they're on that aporte, 70, 80 plus dollars. You know, I just took the time to like find the the same vendors and then like make a more accessible price point. And with the brushes, they're handmade in Italy, you know. And oh my god, the brush is beautiful. And it's I keep it in my bag also because it's like the perfect size. I love it so much, and it's good for the health of your hair. I think we forgot simple things can actually like we have customers with seborrheic dermatitis, and like yeah. like I know it may seem counterintuitive, but like gentle brushing, yeah, absolutely. do less the hair towel too. Little things to make your hair just dry better. Like mm-hmm. sometimes more isn't more. Yeah. So that was very much where it started. Maybe it's not just about the stuff, but it's like the holistic approach to hair care. Speaking of the brush again, because I'm such a fan, I love how spaced apart the bristles are. So when I want to keep my style, because a lot of times I'll just go to bed and put my hair in like a very loose top knot and then wake up and that's like my style for the day. But if I use a regular brush, it brushes out the bend in my hair. Yes. And so I love that it's spaced apart enough that it keeps the style, but like we'll comb it and get rid of any tangles. That's literally the goal. And I always say to at night, I'm like, how you take like prep your hair at night? Oh my gosh. It changes the way it looks in the morning. Yeah, absolutely. The whole thing. That's like the foundation, right? Like what you do with your hair at night. Do you do any like hair oiling at night before you go to sleep? Or I know you mentioned you have fine hair. So do you avoid it? I do have fine hair. I will do pre-wash oils. Yeah, I do So I get a little, I've tried some before where I've like left it in overnight and it just like doesn't agree with my scalp and my hair as much. Granted, there's so many more oils I could try, but I've like, I try everything. Like I've tried the rosemary oils. I've tried the overnight stuff. I, I'm into a pre-wash oil. There's a couple I like, but candidly, I don't do them all the time mm-hmm. just because I, I, I might have like my thing. I've got yeah. it kind of dialed and it it makes a difference, but not in a way that like is a game changer for me. Yeah. What is your thing? I was going to ask you later, but let's get into it now. Oh What's your God. hair routine? Oh my gosh. I mean, I give myself a little scalp massage every day. Okay. I sound like such With a weirdo. With your hands or do you use a massager? I'll either use, I honestly use my fingers a lot. Mm-hmm. I just feel like connecting yeah. is very important. And I'll use our scalp serum because mm-hmm. you don't have to wash it out. Mm-hmm. So I like it's that so you- light. Can, so light. You don't yeah. have to wash it out. It's like hyaluronic acid mm-hmm. for your scalp. I don't use this term often because it's very overused, but it is the skinification of hair. You would never grab an aerosol dry shampoo and like put it on your <laughs> right face. On your face yeah. 
So like maybe you shouldn't do that for your scalp. Right. So whether it's with a scalp serum or a dry shampoo or whatever, it's like thinking about those touch points that are just a little bit more gentle, mm-hmm. but hydrating and good for you. Okay. Before I wash, <laughs> I love that we got into this. Yeah, now. I'm like ready. It's always like the last thing when I talk with people and I'm like, let's get into it. So I brush my hair before I wash it. Mm-hmm. Occasionally I'll do a pre-wash oil, but usually I just go straight into the shower, fully wet my hair with lukewarm water. Mm-hmm double shampoo. I do the same. There used to be, you know, like the, it's like cleanse right? or whatever, like wash, rinse, repeat. Yes. That simple instruction on the back of every drugstore. It's actually life-changing. It's <laughs> actually life-changing, but it got a little confusing because people started putting really harsh surfactants. Yeah. So if you grab an average shampoo and you did a double shampoo and it had a sulfate or even a peg in it, like a yeah. lot of people take sulfates out, mm-hmm. it's going to overstrip your scalp. Right. So like it might work for some people, mm-hmm. but like it could be not Good. Right. And as you know, it's like when you overstrip your skin with like a cleanser, it's going to overproduce oil. Right. So you end up having to wash your hair a ton. Yep. So a naturally derived surfactant system, double cleanse, and then condition. Honestly, I reach for the renewal mask a lot as my like core conditioner. It's like the perfect, again, that Tsubaki seed oil like doesn't weigh it down and it just mm-hmm. makes my hair look so amazing. Once a week or like obviously depending on the frequency of the wash, I'll get the cleansing scrub. I love how it feels lifted at the root. The granules fully dissolved. I, for years, used the Christoph Robin scalp scrub, and it's just like, it's so good. But like Mm -hmm. not color safe, so I couldn't recommend it to friends who color their hair. So I love our scalp scrub. Mm -hmm. And then when I get out, I comb it. I recommend for people who have higher porosity hair putting in your moisturizing products first. Mm -hmm. But I just go straight to my towel, leave my towel in for like 30 minutes, take it out, and then I put in my moisturizing products. Leave in oil mid-length through ends. Uh Then I do my little twist and clippy. Yes. And then I let it dry. Most of the time, especially when I have a fresh cut, like the first two months, I will literally not touch a hot tool. Uh Uh-huh. But when my hair is a little bit longer and like, I kind of think of haircuts as like pruning Mm -hmm. versus like cutting a tree. You want to like prune into it. Yes. So when my hair is longer or heavier, I'll like kind of polish it with like a a curling wand, but you have to use leave-in conditioner or a heat protectant. I think it's all about balance. It's like 80, 20. Yeah. And then that will help me extend my style. Not the first day. If I'm air drying it, I won't brush it, but then following nights, I'll brush it at night and kind of do my little dry shampoo and Mm -hmm. just put it above my head. So when I wake up, I have like a lot of volume in my crown. Yeah. Sometimes when it's long too, I'll put it in a braid at night Mm -hmm. to kind of wake up with that beachy wave. Maybe I'll put in a little leave-in to like let that texture happen. I love thinking about hair as like all the little touch points through your day that like change the way that it is. Mm -hmm. I always joke. I'm like ABC, always be combing (laughs) because it like really does help with shedding and kind of managing it. So like right now, if I didn't comb it all day and I got my brush at night, it would be more tangled. Right. So it's like all the little things that you do. Yeah. Just always keeping is what my husband says. He's like, you're always keeping. (laughs) I'm like, you have to, right? You said a couple things that I think are like major game changers for hair health. And one of them is combing before you get, or brushing before you get in the shower. I think so often people don't do that. And then they're wondering why their hair is a tangled mess when they get out. Just a simple brush beforehand. And then I, I will brush each side and part it down the middle so that when I'm shampooing, I'm getting like right down the middle of the hair. Yes. That makes such a big difference. So you're not tugging and pulling on the hair when it's wet, when it's the most fragile, you know, yes. and then you can have a lot of breakage and snagging and yes. things like that. Also with combing, oh, comb so when your conditioner's in or your yes. hair mask because I've tested it. I've like, I'm curious. So mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm just going to not use the comb. And then when you get out, you're like literally pulling hair out. So just do it while the hair is like moist and in the shot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like so easy. Those conditioning ingredients, whether it's from your leave-in or your hair mask, those temporarily do protect the hair. So a lot of people think it's just cosmetic thing, but you do have temporary protection when you have those products in from the snagging and it helps the cuticle lay flatter so that you're not pulling and snagging the hair. So I think once you start to implement some of those things, like you're so pleasantly surprised with the health of your hair and it's going to allow you, it's kind of like taking care of your skin so you don't have to wear makeup. When you take care of your hair, you don't have to rely on the hot tools so much. Totally. It's a snowball effect. You're going to have healthier and healthier hair. That's the whole entire philosophy. Even with like taking your time, I always say it's about slowing down and like connecting yourself, but it's honestly like take your time back. Yeah. Like you don't have to do as much on the back end if you care for it on the front end. And like candidly, my dream in life is for everyone to use something from Crown Affair. Mm -hmm. But honestly, like even if you don't get something from Crown Affair this second, look at what you have and just make more mindful choices. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at your brush, how can you start implementing it for health? Look at like actually reach for that comb. Like you have this stuff already. Look at what's in your ingredient list. Like just 
assess what you have and what are the things that you can do to improve the health of your hair right now without even buying one more thing, mm-hmm. you know? And a lot of times it is just like using your tools properly, using your hands properly. Like yeah. I love when I brush, I love to brush the scalp just to increase blood flow there. There's so many things you can do with what you already have. Totally. Absolutely. So the beauty space is getting more and more crowded every year. And, you know, four years ago, wasn't that long ago, there was already a lot on the market. Now, your brand is very unique in its philosophy, but did that intimidate you at all, knowing that the space was so crowded? I feel like, first of all, it's so funny, it gets you're like, it gets more crowded every year. I'm like, I feel like it gets more crowded every week yeah. at this yes. point. Like every yeah, week there's true. like a new celebrity brand or a new something that pops up. You know, I feel like being a little bit naive is helpful when you're launching something. I candidly didn't think about it because I've always been going for the big guys. Mm-hmm. Like the brands that I was using, the Kerastases, the Orbes, the Christoph Robbins, like I wasn't even looking at the new brand ecosystem because right. for me with Crown Affair, I will not launch a product unless it's something I'm using mm-hmm. or like my team is using and it's equally as good as those brands. Right. So I wasn't super distracted by like the noise mm-hmm. of new brands. And it's so funny when I was first fundraising, the two brands that would come up all the time with like investors were pros and function of beauty. Yeah. And those are great businesses, mm-hmm. great things, but like I could not stress enough how different what I'm building. Right. You know, and like, it's great that those things exist and people have options, but I'm building like a totally different brand and Mm -hmm. business. So that was kind of the conversation at the time where it's like the customization Mm -hmm. also very much businesses that were built on like paid marketing versus like brand Mm -hmm. or product. Brand identity, like truly building that community. Totally. So, you know, for me, it was like, oh, that those are my competitors, like in the conversation. Mm -hmm. But it's obviously changed so much and ultimately it's better for the ecosystem. I think now I've learned that it is an all boats rise situation. Like we're all working together just to get more people to care about taking care of their hair when it comes to the new brands. So true. And for me, it's like, you know, we're still a small company. So like, I'd love to make everything for everybody and that's the vision. But like, we only really launch two formula products a year. Mm -hmm. Like we work with chemists outside of our contract manufacturers. Like we own all of our formulas. Mm -hmm. Like it takes two years to make a good product. That's also clean. I think that's why we see less people enter hair care because Mm -hmm. you wouldn't really launch a brand today. That's not clean. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to make clean products that work, Right. especially in hair. Like if you try a clean product and like your hair doesn't look good or feel good or it feels oil, like you're going to go back to using whatever, Mm -hmm. whether it's OGX or Pantene or anything, you're just going to go back to the thing that works for that works for you. Mm -hmm. I think with makeup and skincare, you can like kind of get a little bit more wiggle room with like, it's clean. Yeah. Does it work? Whether it's a mascara or a blush and like, sure, you might love the super pigmented blush from like Mac or NARS, but like the clean product probably performs in an okay enough yes, way that yes. it's better for your skin, yes, you know? Yeah. So it's interesting with hair care, you just don't have as much wiggle room. So you mm-hmm. see fewer clean brands, I think, enter the space. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the truth is, is like a lot of the people who have entered this space are very specific. So it's like for textured hair, for Latin hair, mm-hmm. for this thing. And I think my vision with Crown Affair is to just build a timeless brand that isn't niche. Right. You know, we do make products that are safe for everybody. Mm-hmm. Like, our moisturizing products you can use on all hair types, mm-hmm. our towels, our combs, all of that. For shampoos, I'll talk to people of different hair types and I'm like, okay, based off how frequently you're washing, you want to use an oil-based, here's five recommendations. Right. And I think that goes back to the into the gloss days is like, I don't want to be everything to everyone. Yeah. I want to mean everything to someone. Yeah. And I can recommend amazing products and brands that aren't just crown affair for your hair. That to me is the magic of beauty. It's not one player takes all. But I do really have a vision to build a timeless brand that transcends anything beyond just us as people, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think now the brand building aspect of a brand is so important because we – we look at our products to be more than just performance, right? We we really like feel like they're kind of like a part of us, an extension of our personality and like the products that we use, the products that are on our shelves. I feel like you can look at someone's shelf and kind of almost know something about their personality and what is important to them. So yeah. I think it's really cool that brands like Crown Affair are kind of paving the way for that. Because for me personally, yeah. if there's two products that are performing equally for me, I'm always, I'm such a brand girl. Like yeah. I love branding. So I will go to the one where it feels like I understand the brand's story and the founder is front facing. I think yeah. that like 
just means so much for a brand now versus yeah. 10 or 15 years ago. Totally. And first of all, I appreciate that so much. And for me too, there's nothing more disappointing when you like see something that like someone's selling you or like mm -hmm. on Instagram or whatever and you buy it and it comes in and it's like cheap and like crappy and like the components terrible or like it's just the stickers peeling off. Like there's nothing worse than yeah. that. There's a product for everything. I love like more affordable products too, but like especially when it comes to hair care, it is about like investing in fewer, better things yeah. with just better ingredients. And again, it goes back to that, like a little bit less will actually do more. So I want people to like open up their box and be like, wow, this is like beautiful and I'm excited mm -hmm. to use it. And all these things hold energy. I always say this, but like the things that you surround yourself with become the visual literacy of your life. Mm -hmm. And as I've gotten older, I've just wanted to choose things that are like a little bit more mindful, that bring me joy. Even something simple like a comb, like of course, like for years, by the way, I had a comb from like CVS that was like a cheapy plastic comb. Mm -hmm. But I love that we work with these amazing artisans in Switzerland who hand carve them and we pay them full wages and like they take all of August off. Yes, it might be more affordable to buy like a comb or hair clip from like wherever, but like who knows who's making it? What are the, where, you know, it's just not everything is created equal. Yeah. So I really wanted to create a brand for people who wanted to like invest in those things. And I know when I see my comb, I'm like excited to use it yes. or like your brush, you like yeah. have it with you. And it like, mm -hmm those things make you look forward to caring for yourself. And like, it's kind of like getting a new workout outfit. <laughs> You're like, I'm going to work out more because I like really want to yeah. wear this outfit. And it's very much the Motivating. same psychology. Yeah. yeah. And also hair is so personal. I think almost more so than skin, right? Like for a lot of us, it's like our shield. It's our, our blanket. It's such a part of our identity. And I mean, we can talk about that for hours yeah. whether or not that's good or bad. But I just think Picking products that really speak to you and and obviously work for your hair is is just going to make you more motivated to care for it and make you feel better. Totally. And I mean, you know this better than anybody. There's just a lack of education out there. Just be like demystifying that your hair changes every six to seven years. Mm -hmm. It's going to change after you have a baby. Yes. It might change if there's a medical condition where you're living. I feel like the language forever too, which we didn't even touch on, but the language in hair care is like very aggressive. It's mm -hmm. like fight, frizz, like yeah. tame, manage. So true. I've never thought about that. It's so aggressive, like way more aggressive than like skincare. Yeah, especially now. It's almost like it's a little bit behind because that was the language in skincare for a long time, right? Yes. But it's evolved so much, but it's just yes. taking a little longer for yeah. to do the same. And skincare has its own host of problems yes. with like aging and probably even worse. But yeah, it's like, okay, what if we shifted the perspective of like loving your hair and like mm -hmm. making frizz your friend being like, okay, it's actually just my hair reaching to the sky for more moisture. So like, yeah. how do I like moisturize it? And yeah. like, you know, be a little bit kinder to it, I think is such a huge part of this too. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of your hair changing, so we had a couple reader questions Yeah, and one of them was like, what are your recommendations for somebody who wants to start kind of embracing their natural hair texture. You know, for years we were all flat ironing, whether you're wavy or curly or coily, like yeah. what, like just the mindset of like starting to embrace what you have naturally and care for your hair rather than kind of trying to tame it into submission. Yeah, I mean, first of all, it's, it's a tough journey no matter what type of hair you have. I think learning to love yourself mm -hmm. as like anyone is, is tricky. Yeah. So the first thing is, there's a couple of things. I think creating the space to be like, acknowledging that this is going to not be like a seamless journey and that you're going to go back and forth. Mm -hmm. The tricky thing with hair is like it takes time, right? It's not this overnight miracle. It's like whether you're growing it out or learning to love your natural texture, like it's not just a week. It's going to take 30 days and 60 yeah. days and 90 days. And, you know, I think there's a couple of things. One, like finding references of people who have done this. Like there's so many amazing people online who have shared their personal journeys with all different hair types. Mm -hmm. I find that actually the hair community of people who are like hair people are some of the most amazing. Yeah, I have a friend down here, Lior, who has very curly hair. Yes, and she, I love her. An angel. Yeah. And like- Her hair is stunning. Stunning. Yeah. And she was straightening and flat ironing her hair and burning it. And it's like, you have the most beautiful mm -hmm. hair, but that transition was not overnight. Right. Took her time to like hydrate it, really let her curls grow out, understand mm -hmm. what's working. She answers every DM. She's one of the most responsive people when people come to her with questions. So I think that's the first thing. You're not yeah. alone. There is a community around this. Right. You know, the second thing I think is just being kinder to yourself. I know that sounds crazy. Like finding products that work for you, researching things. So, oh, getting curious about hair is the other thing. Mm -hmm. Because again, we've been 
this achieving this look, getting this perfect thing, whether it's whatever the style is. Reading books about hair will change your life. Ooh, really? I've got like three or four books. It's so Tell funny. Us. I actually, when I was consulting at Harry's, I bought a bunch of evil books on hair. And like my friend Eric, who's the GM there, was like, this is the most boring book ever. And I'm like, okay, I must just be really into hair. But like mm-hmm. hair is a fiber. I mean, hair literally is how the British empire was built on wool. Like it's sheep's hair. Mm-hmm. I know it's like sheep's hair, but it's still hair. Yeah. Like thinking about hair as a fiber and how it moves and the power of it. And culturally, I mean, there's just so much stuff. There's an amazing quick NPR podcast where a scientist talks about why our hair and our skin tones are different. Ooh. We're familiar with this. You know, your level yeah. of melanin mm-hmm. is based off how close you were to the equator because yeah. it's protecting you. It's the same thing for your hair how close you were to the sun, your hair texture changed to protect Mm -hmm. you from the sun. There are reasons that our hair is the way that it is. And there's such a huge genetic component to this. And I think when you get like a little bit nerdy about it, there's also amazing like articles on like Pixar and like how they've innovated on the technology to like really innovate with character storytelling Mm -hmm. because hair itself is a character. Yes. And I so important when you're describing a character too, right? Like it goes back to it being such a part of our identity. There are literally books that are just silhouettes of famous people and politicians, and you can recognize them based off their hair shape. You know, it's the shape on your head. And I think that, like, once you demystify it and have a little bit of fun with it, you're like, okay, cool. What's the shape on my head? How do I get it there? I also think, too, like, you can go on this journey and then decide not to continue. Absolutely. And that's the biggest thing. It's like, okay, create that space. See what your hair is like naturally. I mean, there's so many girls who have been, like, keratining their hair and doing stuff and, like, the amount of people who are like, since I switched to Crown Affair, I don't have to do that anymore is like epic for me. By the way, you can stop doing a thing for like six months. Mm -hmm. And then if you're like, I kind of like the thing that I'm doing, even if it's not the healthiest thing for me, like then you've at least acknowledged and then you can make a choice based off of knowledge and Mm -hmm. education versus like, oh my God, I've been doing this since I was in high school. I'm going to keep doing this thing, you know? Actually knowing your hair and what your natural hair texture is before you then make a decision about it. And chances are it's probably changed. Yeah. You know? It changes so much. Mine has changed so much since I had a baby. Like the back is so wavy, but the front is still this like kind of straight with a little bit of bend. And I'm like, what do I do with this? I saw, um, I don't know if you know who Ira Nell is. She's like a celebrity hairstylist. A long time ago, I saw her for like a Dyson thing. Yeah. And she was like, the back of your hair is so wavy. And yeah. I'm like, I know, but I don't know what, like I don't know how to have wavy hair because it's always been straight. Yeah. And she's like, play with it, like experiments. And yeah. like try to encourage those waves to come out a little bit. And I have yet to do it. Like I still do my hair the same way all yeah. the time, but it's on my list. I yeah. would like to, and you were like, the queen of the air dry with your like twists and your clips. Can you tell us a little bit? Cause I, I think I need to try that. I think that will help my waves come out a little bit. It's such a game changer. I mean, first and foremost, you're still going to have like the natural texture in yeah. the back of your hair, yes. but that's okay. Mm-hmm. Again, like I love a blowout. I love doing all of that, but like not every day yeah. needs to be that. And honestly, with the way that I live my life, which is I work from home most days, I'm on zoom calls. It's mm-hmm. more about like dialing it for the front. And of course, when I have yes. events or like appearance, like then I like will do my hair full on and take yeah. that time. So after you wash it, you want to put in your moisturizing products. If you have wavy hair, even some straight hair and some curly hair, mm-hmm. this is great for. The technique is literally twisting your hair into sections and clipping it in parts. So for me, that's the mm-hmm. front. I twist it. Okay. It gives me the same twist as if I used a curling iron, that's so crazy. which is crazy. If I have an, like something that I want to, I might go in and straighten a little bit at uh-huh. the front. Okay. But it's the longer my hair gets, like it's just so easy. So I twist and clip it. Okay. I do it here. And then the bottom, again, my hair's very long right mm-hmm. now, but when it's cut into really nicely, yeah. I'll either section the two bottom and twist them together mm-hmm. or I'll like double section it. And again, depending on like if your hair's super thick or right. whatever it is, or like my friend Chloe on TikTok has done one for short hair girlies Mm -hmm. where she like twists it kind of tighter because I'll put it under my chin and I leave it for like an hour or two. And then when I take it out, it has that like wave effect. And how wet is your hair when you do this? So how wet is my hair? It's post towel. Okay. So it's damp. It's not like 80% dry. I would say it's like 60% dry. And then I put it in and then I take it out when it's like 10%. Okay. I kind of like it getting that last 10% just like hanging okay. down. If I don't do this, my hair is stringier and doesn't yeah. have like the wave. Yeah. Which I like. And then yes. I kind of like shake it out. It looks so nice. Yeah. I'm going to, I'll um, leave one of your videos of you doing yes. it in the show notes so people can like get a good visual. Yeah. 
It's so easy. It's and so you know, it easy. Looks beautiful when you do it. Thank you. And try different yeah. things too. Like there's different products that work for different people. If there's like an air dry product or something, but like again, hair's just a shape. So like have fun playing with it and like yeah. put it in shapes and see how it holds. Yeah, absolutely. We got to most of the reader hair questions. Do you do any salon treatments other than a cut? I do not. No color, no, no deep masks at a salon, nothing like that. No, I just, yeah, no color, just a cut. I am like a very big proponent for like health over style. Mm -hmm. And for years I've wanted to go red and there's an amazing stylist in New York, Jenna Perry, mm -hmm. who I've known for years now. I've been going to my stylist for 13 years. Wow. She's epic. Her name's Teddy Cranford. She's very much the one who like, I mean, I've been dry cutting for eight years. Like mm -hmm. I have so many thoughts on kind of the salon ecosystem because the whole culture is like you, most cases, at least in the States, you go in, they wash your hair, yep. put a cape on you. Maybe they give you coffee or water, wash your hair with a product that might not be best for your scalp mm -hmm. and strands, whatever. And then they cut it wet, not really knowing your natural texture. And then they blow it dry and you feel amazing yeah. for like three to five days or whatever, how long mm -hmm. you're dry shampooing. And then you wash it at home and you're like, why doesn't it look the same? So I think there's a ton of innovation there around like dry cutting. And with Jenna, I've like, I've been wanting to go red for years and she's like, you're gonna have to bleach the whole thing. And I just know too much about the chemicals now. And it's like hard for me to rationalize right. it. But before I did it, now I just know too much. But I don't know. I wouldn't do that to her. You've never colored your hair, right? Mm -hmm. I remember having this conversation with you yeah. before. Yeah. My sister, by the way, has been coloring her hair since she was like 16 or something, yeah. full blonde. Uh -huh. Wow. And it is my life's mission. She'll hate that I'm saying this now to like get her to, she's like, my hair is too mousy. My hair is too this. I'm like, you got to let it live. Yeah. And then like you said, you can transition with like mm -hmm. glosses and I do feel like if you lean into it, and I know so many people who are like, I do feel like there's ways to maintain it where you can still reach for color, mm -hmm. but do it in a way that isn't as damaging now. Yeah. And there's a lot more formulations on the market that are just a little bit healthier mm -hmm. for your hair. Yeah. And your, 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 your hair takes product differently when it's dry. That's why, by the way, there's this whole industry around mm -hmm. bond repair. Yeah. Because you're damaging your hair, but it's like, what if you didn't damage your hair in the first place. Yeah. It's interesting because I had the head of R&D for K18 on the, yeah. I've interviewed her. It's so interesting to hear. I've colored my hair for years. Like I highlighted it for a long time. Then I would color it even darker. Then I would highlight it. And I would be like, well, I'm going to the same person, but it's coming out different every time. Like yeah. I wonder why. And she's like, everything affects it. Everything. Like what's on your hair? Like the environment, The is your hair dry right now? Is it is it moisturized? All those things. So when you go in to see to get your hair cut, do you come in with it air dried and she yeah. she doesn't blow it out for you before? No, no blowout. So oh. it's really interesting because like Teddy obviously has clients that like want that experience because yes. it's the traditional experience. So she still does it. But for the last eight years, I'm actually going on Tuesday next mm -hmm. week. So whatever, I guess what are we recording this on Friday? So yeah. I get this cut in a couple of days. So on Monday, I go to New York, I land on Monday. I will wash my hair that night. I will do my full ritual, which I just shared with you. Mm -hmm. Towel, comb, I'll put my leave-in and oil. I go in Tuesday morning, fully air dried. Okay. And then she prunes it like a tree. Yeah. Again, instead of cutting a limb off straight across, mm -hmm. she'll like cut into it. I love that. Take the weight out, understands how my hair. So when I go home and like if I want her to like blow it, because you can blow it a mm -hmm. little, I will. But nine times out of 10, I just have her do it that way. And then that way when I wash my hair in two days, it looks the same. Right. Yeah. That's my whole strategy with it. That's so interesting. So I also get my hair cut dry, but she does blow it out first. So she'll wash and blow out and then cut. That's so, but I guess also it makes sense for like the style I do is very like that bouncy kind of like I blow my hair out once a week. Like I yeah. wash my hair once or twice a week and I blow it out usually yeah. once a week with like my Dyson. That's like like my routine, like yeah. always. And that will last me. I mean, yeah. it really will last me a full week if I wanted to stretch it. So totally. And I think that's the learning here, right? It's like cut your hair however you're, you like styling it. Yeah. That's yeah, what you need exactly. to work Exactly. That makes the most sense, right? Because you're totally. never going to be able to recreate the style. No. If someone is new to Crown Affair, it's their first time purchasing a product. What's like your favorite? Where would you start? <sighs> There's three things and they're all so different. Okay. I feel like the lowest options. Uh, options, options here, depending on your existing routine, the lowest barrier to entry is the towel. Okay. I know it's so silly because there's like a million towels on Amazon and there's yeah. been like the towels that have existed forever, but it truly is just better. It like dries your hair quicker. We have a patent on the design. Really? We've, it was one of the first things I did when launching the company was file Smart. a patent on the shape. 
the way that it absorbs and like if you're not using a hair towel yeah. right like let's just say you're not even using a hair towel you're gonna notice yeah. a night yeah if you're difference. not using a hair towel that's the first thing you should do is yeah get, get a hair towel, towel. <laughs> yeah. it will literally like your hair you know this your hair is vulnerable yeah. when it's wet and if you just like let it hang mm -hmm. fully damp it's not going to be the same it's not going to yeah. take products the same it's not going to dry the same so 101 hair towel mm -hmm. It's amazing. Also, like you feel like this luxurious spa experience yeah. when you use it. It's easy to use. It's light. The, the biggest qualm I have with putting a regular towel in your hair is, is that it's so heavy and it's putting so much tension on the root. It's not good for your hair follicle. You can end up with damaged follicles. You can even end up with hair thinning if you're doing this, like you're washing yes. your hair every other day, putting it in a heavy towel. So these hair so towels are fun. nice and light. They're not going to pull at the scalp. They're so Game much changer. better for your hair. Game changer. So that's the first one. The second one's leave-in conditioner, Okay, which is so interesting because I think most people are afraid of leave-in conditioner mm -hmm. for all the reasons that we said before. Mm -hmm. It's clumpy. It's heavy. If I put too much on, I'm going to have to wash my hair again. Like, especially if you have fine hair, obviously if you have curly or textured hair, you can put more products on and it can hold it. Right. But like for me, I was always, I would try leave-in conditioners and I'm like, this isn't it. Like it's not working. Our leave-in is so lightweight because of that Tsubaki seed oil. And I think of it like a moisturizer for your hair. Yeah. Like you wouldn't cleanse your face and then not put moisturizer yes. on. So true. And it's like so simple, like a couple pumps. I love that it's not a spray. It comes in this beautiful glass bottle. It's again, that experience. A so couple pretty. pumps in, section your hair, Okay. apply it all over. You're just immediately you could do that on wet hair after the shower I do it on my dry hair all the time that to me is like even if you don't do anything else like mm -hmm. get a leave-in to just your hair needs the hydration especially in this country I walk around I'm like everybody's hair's dry yeah everyone's hair's damaged like less is more and that might be better than reaching for some of these like heavy protein mm -hmm. bond builders which can okay. actually like damage your hair mm -hmm. over time this is like a buildable situation okay and then the third product is like forget everything else for a second, stop using aerosol dry shampoo mm -hmm. in this moment in time, go get the crown of hair dry shampoo. Yeah, it's so good. Like, especially for someone, obviously, you know, you're like, I do my hair once a week or whatever it is, like it lasts. Yeah. Honestly, like the fact that I used to use all those popular aerosol dry shampoos, like my hair would get like gritty and build yeah. up and chalky and like it's clogging my hair follicles. Yeah. I can go, I mean, I did 11 days at Burning Man this year. I blew my hair out so it would stay. And I literally, my hair looked like it was new on day 11. It was crazy. That is something so special about the Crown Affair dry shampoo specifically. Like, I don't know what magic is in it, but it really does like, if you're one of those people, I get this DM all the time where they're like, oh, I used a dry shampoo and my hair somehow feels greasier. Yeah. This is the solution for you. Like it really absorbs everything. And I'll put it in like just after I shower because I like the way it makes my hair look. Like it gives it a little bit of volume. It, I don't know what it is, but it just makes my roots look cleaner and like fluffier and lighter. I always, and it smells amazing. Oh my gosh, it smells so good. I always joke, it's a dry shampoo, but honestly, it's kind of like a texturizing product yeah, too. Even if really you don't is. need a dry shampoo, I, for years, and I still love it, the Orbe texturizing spray, mm -hmm. which is aerosol. And again, yeah. it's like that 80-20 of balance, right. but like the Orbe texturizing spray is like holy grail, amazing. Yeah. But I don't want to use it every day, mm -hmm. you know? So I literally will just do a light dap because it's so, you know, the way you apply the dry shampoo, the crown of hair dry shampoo. And I kind of get that like Kate Moss yes. volume oh, it. without having to use the aerosol. Yeah, so. it's so good. Here, yeah. So last couple of questions. What is your most underrated hair tip? Like something that you think we can easily be doing to change our hair and we're just overlooking it. Uh, I mean, all of the ones that we mentioned, yeah, we like mentioned are so we've talked about ones. a lot. Yeah. Because it is all these little steps. Yes. I would say, oh my God, I don't even, there's so many. Like immediately I'm like, oh my God, use a silk scrunchie. Mm -hmm. Like if you're not oh, using a silk a scrunchie, yeah. it's such a little thing. Or like hair clips. Mm -hmm. Like there's little things that are more gentle on your hair. You know, using a comb that doesn't, that has like rounded edges. Mm -hmm. So your scalp's not as harsh. But honestly, like 101, look at your shampoo. Okay. What's in your shampoo? And like, it goes back to what we were saying. I think so many people feel confused about how to take care of their hair. And I'm like, let's just start with looking at the ingredients in your shampoo and let's right. find you the right shampoo. Because my whole thing with Crown Affair too, like we are busy people who don't want to wash our hair all the time. I know yeah. that's for me. I'm all about figuring out how to extend wash day. Yes, me too. <laughs> and, like, that's literally the strategy. Yeah. And finding the right shampoo will totally change the game for like your roots, the health yes, of your hair, I agree. how your hair dries. So like finding that right shampoo and then double cleansing and it's funny, like most people, it's, it seems like, of course, everyone knows how to shampoo. Of course, everyone knows how to apply sunscreen. These seem like simple things, right. but like 
It's not, it's not yeah. the case. Yeah. So starting there, like foundationally, I think makes a huge difference. Those are all like essential tips, yeah. essentials in my hair routine. Yeah. Last question. If you could tell your younger self one thing, what would it be? Uh, I would say, I well, I wish I was like kinder to my younger self. I would say, I want to say like, don't worry about what other people think, but that's like an impossible thing to do in right. our society. So that's not really good advice. I used to say like, take your time, but I do genuinely feel like I have been mindful about like the choices I've made. I wish I could tell my younger self that like you're enough, you know, because so much of like being a human and being a woman in the world mm -hmm. is like constantly not feeling like enough. And I, you know, my parents told me I'm great, like all this stuff. It's not like that, but I think that's the biggest thing I'm even working on now is like not being reactive about how to solve, but actually like leading from that place of feminine energy and mm -hmm. like giving things time and space. Mm -hmm. And I think that's rooted, that reactiveness comes from not feeling like enough, mm -hmm. you know? So I don't know when it happened. It was probably like my teenage years, but like you are enough as you are. And then all the extra stuff is just, it's bonus, you know? Yeah. I couldn't agree more. That's yeah. a great note to end on. <laughs> Thank you so much. I feel like we have to do a part two because I could talk about hair for for two more hours, but yeah. thank you for all the insight. I'm just so happy you, you took the time to come on and I know the audience is going to gain a lot from this. Thank you for having me. This is yeah. amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Don't forget to rate and review the show and subscribe. And as always, you can follow me on Instagram at Amy Coberling and my DMs are always open.